Hebrews chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 9 tells us that it was a shadow of things to come. And in all, all actuality, God's favorite house is you and me. But understanding the Old Testament tabernacle is something that will help you yield your life to the fullness of what God wants to do in you. So for instance, when we talk about Jesus, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, where did the whole concept of Jesus, the Lamb, taking away sin? It come from the tabernacle when a lamb was offered on the altar and this blood was shed and the animal was, was sacrificed for the person. And so the concept was the innocent died for the guilty. And so Christ, the innocent who there was no sin, died for us. So that's where that concept come from. There's so much more I want to show you about all of these things. So let me just begin by sharing a couple of New Testament scriptures, giving an overview of this thing real quickly, and then throughout this process, basically, I will have one piece of furniture at a time up here. But we'll divide this thing up so that you get a little bit of an understanding, and you'll leave here today knowing how this relates to you because this happened several thousand years ago, and you need to know that today this thing is still alive and well in terms of Hebrews also says that when Moses made this thing, he made it after a pattern God showed him in heaven. So in other words, there is a tabernacle function in heaven. And then when Jesus said for us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, not only does that mean that we function in order and structure according to heaven's marching orders, such as our character and attitude, but it also, because there is a, a tabernacle in heaven, if we understand the tabernacle here, we can function in harmony with heaven. And if we can function in harmony with heaven on earth as it is in heaven, then what happens is every need supplied. What it is is daily bread comes. What it is is that kingdom comes. The enemy is rebuked and you draw closer to God. So let's go to the scriptures real quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> and begin with verse number 16 and 17. Then we're going to flip through a few pictures. Uh, I'm going to read two passages of scripture in 1 Corinthians 3 and then 1 Corinthians 6. Then we're going to flip through some, uh, some pictures uh, real quickly just so that you can contextualize this. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God? and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Do you see that? Now we could preach on the judgmental, the judgmental things there of destroying the temple, but here's what I know. The temple has to be consecrated. Once the temple is consecrated, it's after the consecration that the impending judgment could come if that the temple is not properly managed. And we'll get into that a little bit later on. It'll make total sense a little bit later on. So 1 Corinthians chapter 6 basically says nearly the, the same thing. It says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and spirit, which are God's. So they belong to God. It's, it's God's possession. And so let's take a look at the temple in a way that will make sense and be a blessing to you. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to move my stuff over here to the golden incense altar. And uh, if I can just have you guys to maybe move that thing out of the way, if somebody can grab that real quick and just set it down out of the way. Let's click through some pictures while they are moving that. It's the attachments on Planning Center. You don't have it. They didn't download. So I can't do that. Quickly find me a picture of the, tab the tabernacle online if you can. So basically, let me try to explain it without, you know, I know we're in a kind of a, 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 a time. He turned the water over. That's okay. <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> Father, Son, Holy Ghost. <laughs> I, 
<laughs> That's awesome. So let me try to explain this thing. This thing, in the Old Testament, when God began to give the, t the nation of Israel a way to worship in a systematic way that helped them to understand the revelation of who God was showing himself to be, he gave them a, 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 a design of what was first called the tabernacle. It might be known, if you've ever heard it, the tabernacle in the wilderness. It was basically a tent-looking thing. I'll tell you what to throw up. That picture you had just a minute ago of the cross, and that'll help me just a little bit while you might be hunting, but, but uh, where it looked like a cross, the, the, where the tabernacle was in the middle and the cross. When, yes, that one there. Thank you. Uh, where that smoke is right there, there would have been the tabernacle, and it'll help me a little bit. Uh, not so much, but, but let me just try to work with this just a little bit. It, it was this thing that looks like a tent right over the eye right there. You can't hardly see it in that picture. I hope to have you some. I don't, I'm not sure why that didn't download. But um, basically, you had this thing that looked like a rectangle, which was called the tabernacle. It had a curtain all the way around it. And it had one door, and the door was on the side of the east, which would have been over here. And that one door was the only way into this thing. And because we know that the Bible is Christocentric, meaning it's about Christ, when Jesus says, I am the way, the way, what he is specifically referring to is I'm that door. I'm the only way into the glory of God. So he says, I'm the door into the sheepfold. When you see that in the New Testament, how many of you have ever read that passage of Scripture when Jesus says, I am the door into the sheepfold. Any man coming any other way is the same as a thief and a robber. In other words, what he's talking about is you, if you try to climb over the tent in any other place to get to God, you're a thief and a robber. You've got to come back to the door. And the door is the place where you get into it. But at the door, the first thing you see is this thing here. Now, I'm not going to get into that right now, I don't think. But basically, once you got in, all you could see once you walked through the door would be these two pieces of furniture, this and this. Now these are not perfectly aligned because we've got stuff here here and don't have the room. But these would be in a line and right here would be a veil. You could not see beyond this point. And it would be veiled from here all the way back to here. There would be one more veil here so as to see this would be two compartments. One would be made up of these three things and the other of this thing alone okay so here's what they would be called this portion would be called the outer court this portion would be called the inner court or the holy place and this portion behind this veil would be the holy of holies or the holiest of all are you are you tracking with me those of you that are biblically literate you know this if you're brand new in God this is or if you've never seen anything like this, this can be tough to try to explain. That's why I had you some pictures, and I'm not sure what happened. So there was two veils. Now this tent was, was with the people of God, and the Lord told them how to make, or told Moses how to make every single one of these. Some of them were made with wood, overlaid with gold. Some of them were solid gold, beaten into shape. This thing was a solid piece of wood gold hammered into shape when you understand the holy spirit we'll, we'll 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 get you there here a little later on this was wood overlaid with gold so on and so forth but these two things were brass these were were brass instruments and 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 i'm not going to get down into all see i'm trying to do this without this being our series for the next year and a half so I'm going to skip over a whole lot of stuff. The wood is earthly. The gold is royalty. The wood would represent the cross. The gold would represent the glory. I'm not going to get into all of those things to try to help you to understand every single corner and piece and part. But I am going to take some of those things to kind of help you how to function in the things of God to the point where God gets permission to inhabit this house unlike never before. 
And when we talk about the enemy being evicted and God coming up and taking residence, there you go. Right there is uh, uh, one of the pictures that we put up. Thank you for that. That would be the first, what kind of it looked like at first is what we believe it would be. And do you have the next picture? Maybe go on to the next one. There's a little replica. You can buy those things. That was when it was just kind of made a little bit better, believed to be once it eventually got into the promised land. So here, just stop right there for a minute. So what happened was when God gave them the design for this thing, Moses made this with some people that had the skill and the ability and the talents to do this. And they made it and set it up. And once it was made and set up, God told Moses to sanctify it, to set it apart to him. Once he sanctified it, consecrated it, devoted it to the Lord, no more could anybody touch this without dying. No more were they to let the fire that would be in here go out. No more would they let the fire on these go out. And no more would they let the fire go out in this. On this thing, there would be 12 pieces of bread and they were to be made fresh and put on here at specific times. Water was to be put in here and utilized on an ongoing basis. And so we're going to look at all of those things. But once it was consecrated, God sent a fire from heaven that ignited right there and they were supposed to do something with that fire. The first thing was to never let it go out. The fire was supposed to never go out and there's a way that they kept that fire burning and we'll learn that a little bit later on because that is very much pertinent to your new testament walk but we'll get there a little bit later on what we're trying to do is help you to see that there are three dimensions to this thing let's go on a little bit farther to, to the next picture do we have it yes okay let's just kind of stick with that one a little bit because it's hard to see i know uh, maybe one day we'll have a bunch of HD stuff that will be easier for you to see, but we've got to have a lot of money to be able to put that up. And God's going to give you somebody in here a whole lot of money, and you're going to be generous, and you're going to give. God's going to bless you tremendously. Some of you are going to be millionaires, and God's going to bless you to be able to bless the kingdom of God so people can learn and know and understand this stuff a little bit better. And if you're in on that, say amen. Dear God, all of you will be millionaires. Okay. Anyway. If I do that TV style, I've got to go back and just say that before the offering. I'm sorry. Come out of him in the name of Jesus. No, I, I don't mean all TV preachers that way. I do not mean, I don't believe that. But anyway, you can see that the top is kind of ripped off of this thing so that you can see the door, the altar, the laver, and then you would go through that veil and into the next dimension, another veil, and finally into this dimension of, of what would happen in that but let's let's just begin with the fact that you know that there is a tap a tabernacle now let me just say this before i move on the next thing this this thing when, once it gets into the promised land and it's there and it's set up in in in, in uh in uh, the the town of david for a while basically what happens is um uh, um, D David get, begins to one day say, you know what, I, I, I dwell in a palace, but God lives in a tent. And I want to build him a tent. Now this is later after the Ark of the Covenant has come back and all that, and I'm skipping over a lot of things, but I want to help you to get to the understanding that, that David wanted to build God a more permanent structure, not just a tent. The tent served purpose because it needed to be mobile. So what would happen would be there would be a, a, a cloud by day but once that cloud began to move he instructed the nation of israel pack this stuff up and start moving with me and so they would have to pack it up can you imagine what this stuff weighed overlaid in gold can you imagine what this thing weighed in brass and we just picking up a piece of wood that's painted pr pretty uh this stuff some people have said that the, the supernatural strength would come upon the levites as they would carry this stuff from place to place if they had to carry it overnight there would be a fire that would lead them the, when the cloud stopped they were to stop set it all back up again and keep the sacrifices rolling as a way to approach God but once this thing eventually got into the promised land and after a period of time David said I, I live in a palace but God lives in a tent and I want to make him something that's beautiful and great and God says you cannot build me a temple because you're a man of war or blood. 
He said, but your son Solomon will. So from that time, David made alliances and laid up uh, the materials in order for this thing to be built. When Solomon, his son, becomes king, he eventually builds what would be known as one of the seven wonders of the world, a multi-billion dollar temple, but set up in the same way. It had an outer court, an inner court, or a holy place, and the holiest of holies, the most holy place. And so whether the Bible says, know you not that your body is the temple, and I refer to tabernacle at times, I want you to understand that the approach is the exact same, okay? The approach was the exact same. There was the same amount of offerings. There was the same amount of operating there and throughout this thing. So let's just leave that for a moment and look at the fact that this thing had three dimensions to it. Three dimensions that that would be God's divine number. Because you've got the Son completely expressed as dying on the innocent, dying for the guilty. The one who makes clean and pure. Then you have the Holy Spirit, fire and anointing oil. You got the Holy Spirit that brings revelation to bread of life. You got Holy Spirit bringing revelation to intimate worship and true intercessory prayer. But then you've got Father on the last portion, and it is heavy weight of glory. So you see, it's the, the, the divine number of God. Uh, it's God's complete number. God made man in body, soul, and spirit. Jesus prayed three times in the garden before his arrest. He was placed on the cross the third hour of the day, which was nine in the morning. He died at the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m. There were three hours of darkness that covered the land while Jesus suffered on the cross from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. And if you'll notice, they are all divisibles of three. Three is the number of resurrection as Christ died and on the third day, he rose again. Jesus had three disciples closer to him than the other disciples, Peter, James, and John. God is mentioned in the Old Testament in three dimensions. He's the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. When the, the gifts were come, came at Jesus Christ's uh, announcement of his, um, uh, of his birth, three gifts were given, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. God, de God is declared thrice holy at the, the, the two glimpses of the throne in Isaiah and Revelation as the angel cried, holy, holy, holy. He's thrice holy. Jesus said of himself in the book of Revelation, declaring of himself in three dimensions, was, is, and is to come. The Holy Spirit came on the third hour of the day. Another divisible of three would be nine o'clock in the morning. So the scripture mentions on the third hour of the day. But Jesus said something specific about himself. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Everything about Jesus' ministry was to show you the way to declare to you the truth so that you can have the life. And so when you understand this in its total dimension, you realize that God is expressing something to us in a divine, orderly way. Now, while every bit of this we could find Christ in it, and I can show you Christ in this, Christ in this, Christ in this as the spirit baptizer, Christ as the bread of life, Christ as the means of intercession, and Christ as the means of the way to the glory. I can show you Christ in all of it. You have to remember that we are the body of Christ. We're Christians, so inside of you is a working, operating temple that if it's defiled, God destroys. But if it operates right, there's fresh fire, there's fresh oil, there's fresh bread, and there's fresh glory if it operates correctly. Exodus says this, Exodus 26, 1 through 4 says, Moreover, you shall make a tabernacle with the curtains of fine linen woven with blue, purple, scarlet, 
thread and the artisan design of cherubim, you shall weave them and the wide-eyed wonder of the glory to glory experience last part added. Here's what I want you to understand. We're looking at the three dimensions and here's some things you got to see and I'm going to let you go home. You've got the way, which is the sacrifice. You've got the truth, which is the burning fire of the Holy Spirit. But as I told you, there is a, a veil here. There's a veil between the way and the truth. Now some would say, didn't Jesus tear the veil in, in, in the temple when he died on the cross? And if so, yes, which veil did he tear? Did he tear the one where the Holy of Holies is? Or did he tear the one where the most holy place is? And those things are questions. But before we get to all of that, I want you to understand that for this, for this sake... Right now, this thing is veiled. So, if that, this were the real temple, out here I could see all of you and I could see everything. But if I step through here, I cannot see unless these are burning. When these are burning, now I can see. But what I see is blue, purple, and scarlet cherubims. Do you know what a cherubim is? A cherubim is an angel. An angel that has six wings. Two with it flies. Two it covers its feet. And two it covers its head. It's, it's, its eyes, its face at times. It's revealed in Scripture in Ezekiel as well as in Revelation that these creatures are revealed, these cherubim, as having the head of a man, the head of an ox, the head of an eagle, and a head of a lion. It has multiple eyes. And so when you step through this dimension out here, you see dying animals, you see all the things that this life has to reveal to you, but in here, there's a wide-eyed wonder that begins to happen. You start seeing a dimension that you could not see before that are the artisans put here as an expression. Blue is the expression of heaven. Purple is the expression of royalty. And gold is the expression of value or worth. And here's the idea that when you step into this dimension, the only way you can see is if these lights are burning and God is doing something with inside of you to bring you into the place where Paul said, your eye hath not seen, your ear hath not heard, neither has it entered in the heart of man what God has prepared for them, but it shall be revealed by the Holy Spirit. When the spirit fire is burning, a wonder of heaven's glory and royalty and expression is ignited in the life of the person who dares to be filled and ignited by the Holy Spirit. So you have three dimensions. In these three dimensions are God's expression of Son, Spirit, Father. And he says, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are God's temple let me ask you are you really God's temple how you can know is an inner inventory is there a place where the Savior died for your sin somewhere in your heart is there a place where you go the washing of the water of the word to cleanse yourself from ungodliness is there a fire of the spirit burning and the anointing over your life? Do you find bread in the Word of God when you open its pages? Has God helped you to understand the burning fire of sacrifices, how you pray so you can understand what true prayer, intercession, intercession and being with God? And do you have a place that you're constantly going so that you are experiencing the glory of God? That's God's plan for your life. That's how God's going to manifest himself to you. And once you see how all these operate, you're going to find out, I'm the temple of God. Do you know this thing shaped culture? And the church lets culture shape. Do you know that this thing was the expression of righteousness? 
And the world doesn't look to the church anymore for the expression of righteousness. Why? Because we lost what it looks like to consecrate to God and live as temples of the living God, the place where the cloud moves, the place where the fire moves. Stand with me.